look at Luke chapter 11, from verse 1 through 8. So we'll look at Luke chapter 11, from verse 1 through 8. Luke chapter 11, from verse 1 through 8, from verse 1, it says, One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. He said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Uh, give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we have also forgiven everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. Then he said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend, and he goes to him at midnight and says, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread, because a friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. The one inside answers, Don't bother me. The door is already locked, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot, can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him the bread, because he is his friend, yet because of the man's boldness, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. The title of today's message is, Thy Kingdom Come. And Thy Kingdom Come. So we'll look at the Lord's Prayer and also at this parable the Lord gives afterwards. And we'll look at these two things today with the title, Thy Kingdom Come. So, uh, the Lord's Prayer is a very important uh, prayer that the Lord taught us. It, he taught us how to pray through uh, the Lord's Prayer. And when you look, uh, prayer, of course, is a very important aspect of faith. Uh, we shouldn't disregard prayer at all. Uh, sometimes we uh, are too much in our own head, right? And then when we look at prayer, uh, we just see prayer as perhaps just something spiritual, like a spiritual feeling, something emotional, and maybe it doesn't matter. It, is not, it doesn't matter as much as up here in our head, but really when you look at prayer, it is so so important. I think even when I look back at my own faith, I think this is probably the mistake I made early on in faith, later realizing uh, that prayer is so important and that I was weak in prayer and uh, very immature in my faith because, you know, really when it comes to prayer, we should pray. You know, it's so, so important to pray to God. And so prayer is so, so important to our life of faith and we should look at it uh, very carefully, very well, and we should learn uh, like the Lord teaches us through this Lord's Prayer and the parable, how to pray. So, um, that's what's going on here. Basically, the disciples come up to uh, the Lord and ask them, uh, teach us how to pray, right? So, teach us how to pray. So, you know, that's a great question, right? Uh, that's a great question to ask Jesus. Uh, we don't know, right? So, if I don't know, so we're wondering about prayer, and I don't know how to pray, then we should go ask Jesus. He was a very smart thing to do, right? Go ask the Lord to teach us how to pray. And so that is the context of the Lord's Prayer. We need to know the, Lord, the Lord's Prayer came out of that question, right? You know, they teach to the Lord to teach us how to pray. The Lord's Prayer is that teaching in how to pray. So um, when you look at the Lord's Prayer, it is something like that. It is the structure of basically all the components that we really, really need, the important, important components when it comes to prayer. So I think most of you already know the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer is more out in full, though the traditional Lord's Prayer that we pray um, is more recorded in Matthew chapter, uh, Matthew chapter 6, right? But um, on the Sermon on the Mount, but we're looking at Luke. And the reason why I'm looking at Luke today is because even though Luke doesn't have the full traditional Lord's Prayer that we pray, what Luke does really well is he breaks it down. Right? He breaks it down into the components uh, that we really, really need to focus on and concentrate on. Actually, everything is here. Everything recorded here in Luke is also the full Lord's Prayer that we say in Matthew, uh, but it's just more direct uh, here. And so what this shows us, and, and how Luke breaks it down, is he breaks it down into five parts. Right? He breaks the Lord's Prayer down into five parts. And uh, we see that among those five parts, two of those parts are speaking to us about the premise of prayer. Right? Two of those parts are speaking about the premise of prayer. And the three other aspects, the three other things, are the practical things that we should pray for. Right? So, among the five, two are the premise, 
and three are practical things that we should pray for. So, uh, the first thing I want to look at is the two premises first. The two premises of prayer. So, what is the premise of prayer? The first one is, or Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Like I said, it's more fleshed out in Matthew. And so, if we know the Lord's Prayer, we know that. Or Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So, uh, that first premise of prayer is Jesus speaking to us about who it is that we are praying for. Praying to, right? Who is it that we are praying to when we pray? So, you know, when we pray, are we praying to some trees? Or are we praying to some tree and some stones? Or maybe the ocean or something like this? We're not praying to uh, those kinds of things, right? And so, you know, really, actually, people pray to these things, but we need to know that the Bible teaches us that we are not praying to those things. No, very clearly, we are praying to our Father, right, who art in heaven. So we're praying to our heavenly Father God. And we're praying to our heavenly Father God who is alive and he is faithfully protecting us and sustaining us. So when we pray, we need to know who we are praying to and that is our heavenly Father God. It is that the Father God is alive and active inside of our life. He is protecting us. He is the eternal, transcendent God, loving God. He loves us and he's living in our lives too. Not only is he up there in heaven, but he is with us, loving us, and he is our creator God. And who are we? Uh, we need to know that it is the Heavenly Father who created us, right? So if he is the creator, and then we are the creation, then how are we created? Well, we are created out of his love. Right? So we were created in his image, in the image of God we were created, and we were created in his love. And so, you know, if we were created in his image and we really are created really to receive his love, then what does the Lord, what does the Bible say in Genesis 1? It says, be fruitful, right? Be fruitful. So those of us created in his image should be fruitful. So we should become a fruit of our loving creator. So what does a fruit of our loving Creator, what does the fruit of God do? We glorify, right? We glorify God's love in us. We glorify God Himself. Uh, that means, hallowed be thy name, right? Hallowed be thy name. That's why this first premise is, or Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It is, that, it is the great Creator, loving God, who created us in His image. We receive His love. And we are glorifying his love, hallowed be thy name, right? That is the premise of us and our life. That is who we are praying to, and that is the premise of our loving relationship with God. Right? When you look at prayer, that is what prayer is. It is a loving communion together with God. And so that's the kind of relationship that we have with God. It means that everything of our life and our purpose is to receive God's love and reveal God's love in His glory, to glorify His name. And hallowed be thy name. Now that is the focus and the premise of our prayer, right? And so that's the, that's the foundation, right? When I say premise, I mean the foundation of our prayer is that we are the people in God's love and hallowed be thy name, be in His love and glory. So, that's the first premise. I said there were two, right? So, that's the first premise. The second premise is, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Right? So, that's, of course, from Matthew again. Here, Luke is just really short. He says, your kingdom come. So, that is the next premise. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So this is something very, very important. This is the, the second premise that, that is very, very fundamental to who we are and our existence. So when you look at our purpose and our calling and our existence, here's the thing. If I have received God's love, and I should also be a fruit of God's love as well too, you know, hallowed be thy name, then... You know, after I have been saved by Jesus Christ, right? We were the ones far away from God in sin. But through Jesus Christ, once again, we can have a relationship of love with God and to be a fruit of love. So, um, after being saved by Jesus Christ, you know, I should really be born again and receive the Holy Spirit. This is the longing for the kingdom. 
So the ones who have been saved by Jesus, we should receive right, the dream of Jesus in us. And this is the longing and the calling for the kingdom. So this is a very, very basic, basic premise in our life that, you know, really when you look at a lot of us, we forget about this, right? We believe in Jesus Christ, right? And then, uh, that is great for me. Uh, and then, you know, we just kind of go off and, and live our life, you know, in the world, but it shouldn't be like that. You know, when God calls us, He wants us to really long for the kingdom. The kingdom should be ever, ever present as a foundation and as our premise inside of us. So it's not something uh, extra, right? And so it's not like I'm walking and then the kingdom is like following me or something like that, or I just do the kingdom thing. It's like the kingdom thing I do on the side. You know, it shouldn't be like that. But when you look at it, it is fundamental inside of the Lord's Prayer, meaning it's, it's premise, right? It should be the premise of our prayer, the premise of our relationship with God, the premise and existence of our life is one that is a part of God's kingdom, not just in heaven, but on earth too, right? Thy kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven. And so I should really, really be a part of this kingdom of God and the coming of the kingdom of God here on earth as it is in heaven. So that is the kingdom, right? We can look at it, you know, as the church. We are the anticipation of the kingdom here on earth. That is the church. Uh, but also, you know, we really have to have the anticipation of the kingdom to come really here on earth through all the earth to all of the lost souls. That is the great commission. And so, you know, the ones who have been saved by Jesus really, really should have an earnest, a very, very deep and earnest, earnest heart for the kingdom. That is fundamentally what the Lord taught us to have. And if we don't have that premise in us, then we're missing something. Then we need to realize, oh, then I'm missing something if I don't have that, right? So maybe I have one. So, oh, if that kingdom come, I should be fruitful and I should love God. So through Jesus Christ, I love God. Maybe we have that. But we also should have this too. We're missing one of the premises of the Lord's Prayer if we don't have this as the existence, the purpose of the existence of our life. It is that kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven. Let's look at 2 Peter chapter 3 and in verse 3. 2 Peter uh, chapter 3 and in verse 3. It says, first of all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. And so, inside of this world, what will happen, and why we get pulled away, why the people of God get pulled away from God's kingdom, is people will scoff. Right? There will be scoffers that come, and they will uh, say, you know, why are you, you know, living for God's kingdom? You should follow the world and the evil desires in the world. So it wants to keep us enslaved in this factory of sin and slavery inside of the world. And then if you continue on, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10 through 13, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with the roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed, and in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and the speed it's coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in heat. But in keeping with the promise, this promise we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. So, you know, when we come to understand about thy kingdom come, we have to know that everything of this world that is sinful, right, that is sinful will have a conclusion. All of sin will meet its, its demise and in its, its end. That's actually like how sin is. When it comes to God, we need to know this is the basic premise of faith, right? There is God, right? And there is sin. And then so there's judgment of sin. And so all sin, even though it looks like it's powerful now, will be destroyed, right? Will face judgment. And only, what are the only things that will remain? It is of God. Right? Only the things of God, the good things of God will remain. Right? And so that is the new heaven and the new earth. And so all the things, will, all the worldly things, the things of the world that are despicable and evil and depraved will meet its end. But the good things of God right, will, you know, we will have a new heaven and a new earth because the good things of God 
You know, the kingdom of God, that kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven. This is the new heaven and new earth. You know, really, the believers, we should pray with this premise. You know, we have to have an earnest heart in us anticipating that. Oh, that is going to come, and I should be excited about it. It's actually nothing to be fearful about, because it means that the evil is gone, and only the, you know, God's goodness will reign and be here. So that's nothing to be fearful about. We're fearful about it because we're thinking about something uh, in this world, and we're trying to selfishly hold on to something in this world, but it's actually just... You know, the kingdom coming here on earth, God wishes for us to really, you know, have the kingdom of God here on earth. So, you know, really we shouldn't live, you know, in this world. We live so stoked by things of the world, like the things of the world, like, like trigger us and make us excited and we could become enslaved to it. It's like politics, entertainment and sex and these things, they stoke us, right? They stoke us and then they stimulate, they like stimulate us. And then, you know, we, we, we just live trying to be stimulated by things of the world, but, you know, we need to know that they are temporary, and they will all fade to an end. Uh, the ones who truly have received Jesus Christ into our hearts, if we have Jesus Christ in our hearts, what builds in our hearts and what Jesus gives us is an urgency, a very, very present urgency for God's kingdom and His righteousness. Like, we don't know when it's going to happen. Like, I don't know when it's going to happen and how it is. The day will come like a thief. Right? That's what the Bible says. That's what Second Peter, we, we see it. It says the day will come like a thief. But even though we don't know when, right, but spiritually, like, in our heart, we are awake. And we have an urgent, real hope now. Right? And so, you know, that's our hearts. Or our hearts know. Right? Even though we don't know, but our hearts really know and we have an urgent, real hope now. And that is the anticipation for God's kingdom. That's the basic premise of believer. Right? If we are a truly, truly a believer, if we've really received Jesus Christ, then the basic premise of us as a believer, right, that the Lord's Prayer is teaching us that we should really, really pray about is thy kingdom come. And this is why I chose this for the title of today's message. There's so many aspects about the Lord's Prayer. Right? I could choose many, many different aspects about the Lord's Prayer to speak about, but you know, what I really, really want us to focus on and really, really remember in us is that kingdom come. Right? That kingdom come. That has to be fundamental, urgent, and present in our heart. It has to be real. That kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven. Not just someday after I die, but here on earth, right now. You know, the really, really urgent hope we have now for the kingdom. So, uh, those were the two uh, basic premises uh, that we look at when it comes to prayer. Uh, now, I want to look at three of the topics that Jesus says we can pray for. So, you know, this is good guidance by the Lord, right? So, if we want to pray in a very holy way, and so, you know, we do that, we have prayer meeting, and then we ask people, you know, what are your prayer topics? And then some people, they don't know, you know, what we should pray for, right? And so, that's kind of like what the disciples are like to Jesus. They're saying, Jesus, Lord, you know, teach us, teach us how to pray. Right? And so they want to know the topics to pray for. So um, here, the, the Lord gives us three uh, topics to pray for. And if we follow the Lord, we can pray in a holy way like this. And so what is the first? It's give us this day our daily bread. Right? So it's giving us our daily bread. So uh, when you look, the Word of God is uh, very real, actually. You know, Jesus, when He tells us to pray, you know, even though He's giving us these premises, and everything, he's also even talking about our today, present life, meaning I need daily bread, right? Meaning, like, I need to eat today. Like, you know, if I'm going to live and I'm going to continue on, then I need to eat today. I need to eat and so I can live. So, you know, of course, when we when talking about this prayer, this is more than just talking about bread. We can talk about, you know, the physical things that sustain us. Uh, you can even talk about money. Um, this is the things that I need every day to go on living, right? And so, you know, if we are lacking in our daily bread, then, you know, we should ask, right? We should ask for it. You know, if a child asks a mom for a snack, then she's going to cook, you know, some food for the child to give a snack, right, to eat. And so if we are hungry and we need bread, then we should pray to God that He will give us or the daily bread because we're hungry and we need it. He loves us like that. And if you look, this is from verse 9 to 11. Uh, so Luke chapter 11, from verse 9 to 11. So I 
Say to you, ask and it will be given to you, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks the door will be opened. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead, and if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? And if he then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So, you know, we should really, really ask. We have to ask, seek, and knock. And God will give us. If we ask, if we're hungry, and then we ask for the bread that we need, then God will give it to us. Just like a mother was going to cook that food for the child if the child's hungry. You know, is the mother just going to like leave the child like that? Oh, you just stay hungry, right? No, she will cook the, the food for the child like that. And so we really should ask the Father God in that way. Uh, but we have to also look at it very carefully. What does it say in terms of how it is being asked? So what the Lord says, he says it very precisely. He says daily bread. Right? He says daily bread. So that's also key too. So uh, it's very, very clear right, that we should ask for what we need in terms of daily bread. So, you know, should we ask God, you know, God, please give me enough bread that will last me a year or for 10 years and then give me all the bread at once so that I can have it and then, you know, like that. Or, or we, there's people that pray like this, like, God, please let me win the lottery. You know, just let me win the lottery, you know, and then, you know, praying like that. No, you know, when you look at the Lord's Prayer, it's very, very clear when it comes to bread, when it comes to material things. Daily, right? Daily bread. So I really, really shouldn't worry about tomorrow. So I should think, you know, what do I need today? Right? What do I need today? Not, not what I need today so that I won't worry about today because, because I'm worrying about tomorrow. No, don't worry about tomorrow. Right? It's just like really, really strip away everything else about everything, about tomorrow and all those things and piling it up. But today, right, the daily bread, ask what I need from God today. You know, we have this greediness inside of us to store up our treasures on earth. And so, you know, the Lord is giving us a very, very proper and very real prayer. So the truth is, is that when you look, you know, man, we do not live on bread alone. Right? We, don't, we don't live on bread alone. And so we should ask God to give us the, more than even the bread that we need in terms of material things. What we need is the spiritual things. Like daily, I need the Word of God. I need the Word of God uh, in, in my life. So how great is God? You know, if we really properly ask to God, you know, God will give us even the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him. He will give us the good and righteous things. He will give, even give us the grace of the Holy Spirit. And so we need that. So that is daily bread. And then next is forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Right? So we need forgiveness. And so actually when it comes to this part about the prayer, right? so it's actually two sides. So it means that we need forgiveness. right? We need to receive forgiveness from God. But also, we need to forgive others as well, too. Right? We need to forgive other people as well, too. So, uh, when you look, uh, actually, Jesus, the way he prays and the way he says things is, is very amazing. So, uh, the law, like when you look at the law, you know, how is the law? The law is like, the, there's a symbol for the law. It's like this blind person, right? And then they're holding the two scales, right? Yeah, have you seen that symbol for the law? You know what I'm talking about? So the blind person with the blindfold around them, and then they're holding two, two scales to, because that's what the law does. The law establishes balance and fairness. So, you know, that's what the law helps, uh, helps out in keeping the society in order. That if you sin, if you commit a crime, then there is a punishment as well, too. So, you know, when it comes to the Lord, you know, it's like unconditional grace, right? So, you know, even if we sin, then he takes that sin from us unconditionally, and it's unconditional grace. But you come to find that, really, this is not against the law, right? This is not against the law. When we, for, when we receive the forgiveness from God through his Son, Jesus Christ, that love should overflow, and there is this fairness, right? That we have to overflow in forgiveness to others. So if we have been forgiven, we should forgive others as well, too. Yeah. Actually, you know, when you look, forgiveness is very, very hard. Right? It's, it's, it's a very, very hard thing to do. 
You know, inside of people's lives, we have like many relationships with one another, and um, it's a very, very hard thing to do. Uh, but, uh, and so, you know, a lot of people say this, like they have a really, really hard time forgiving. Like there's this person I should forgive, but it's really, really hard forgiving that person. And so it's true, forgiveness is really, really hard. It's one of the most difficult things for our hearts to do. So how is it that we can truly forgive? Well, I have to receive forgiveness first. When I receive the forgiveness that comes from Jesus Christ, then the forgiveness I give to others is not a self-generated forgiveness. It is a forgiveness that comes from my heart because the Lord has forgiven me. And so when the love of Jesus overflows in me, that's the power and that is the strength that allows me to forgive others. And so Jesus is a very practical prayer. It's talking about our relationships with one another. You know, so, you know, there's the bread I should pray for, but there's also another thing. There's the relationships I pray for. That, you know, I, my relationship with God, and my relationship with others, it should be in harmony in this way. And so, uh, that's, the, that's the, the second of three things, of, of the practical things he tells us to pray for. And the final thing is, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Right? So the third is, lead us not into temptation. We have to pray that we won't fall into the evilness of this world. You know, we have to remember that God does not tempt us. It, it, when it comes to uh, the tests and the things that we have in this world, um, it is the temptations is from the fallen world. It seems like a, a delicious fruit, and so, you know, we, we see it, we take it, and we eat it, just like it was in Genesis 3. It seems very tempting like that. But we need to know the wages of sin are death. And so who is the one that gave us life? It is Jesus Christ. And so through him, life will overflow to us, so we shouldn't fall into those tempting, tempting things that we see in the world. We should really, really pray for that. Pray that we won't fall into the temptations of the world. We need strength from God because we're weak, right? Because we're weak, we need to pray to God to help us so that we won't fall into temptations. So these three things, uh, daily bread, uh, forgiveness, and then lead us not into temptation, helping us from the temptations of the world. These are the holy topics Jesus gave us to pray for. So, uh, you know, you might ask, well, is it okay to pray for other things? Like, if I have other prayer topics, is it okay to pray for other things? Well, of course. You know, of course it's okay to pray for other things. But also, don't forget these things, right? So we cannot forget these things. So the two premises and the three priorities we have to keep that in us. So if we go off you know, on our own and then we're just like praying for all other kinds of things and then forget the Lord's Prayer, then we're forgetting what is priority. And so it's okay to pray for other things, but we also need to remember that these things are the priority. The way that the Lord teaches us in the Lord's Prayer, uh, this is the priority that we should put in our lives and we shouldn't forget these things. So, uh, we did the Lord's Prayer, and we looked at the basic form of the prayer that, uh, that Jesus gave us. Now, the next thing I want to see is finally uh, the parable that he gave us. And so, let's look at verse 5 until verse 8. So, Luke chapter 11, and verse 5 through 8. Then he said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend, and he goes to him at midnight and says, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread, because a friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. Then the one inside answers, Don't bother me, the door is already locked, and my children are with me in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him the bread because he is his friend, yet because of the man's boldness, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. So, uh, we should explain what this parable is speaking about. Uh, so, uh, really, actually, with this, with the main portion of this parable is helping us understand if there is the premise and if there is the topics that we should pray for, that is the Lord's Prayer, then the Lord is teaching us the fundamental heart, right? The fundamental heart that we should have in our prayer, the deep, deep heart, the fundamental deep part of our heart that we should have in prayer. And so he's giving this parable to help us understand the deep heart that we should have. And so that's a very basic thing too, right? We should have a very deep heart when it comes to prayer. So how can we explain this parable? So what's happening here is there is a friend, and he is going to another friend, and it's midnight. And he's saying, you know, knock, 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 knock. And he's saying, 
you know, please give me some bread, right? He wants three loaves of bread, you know, please, you know, give me these three loaves of bread. And the re and, and so, you know, will will he and then he's saying the reason why I need this bread is because, you know, at my house, there's someone who just came. It's another friend that came at midnight, and he was coming on a journey, and I have nothing to feed him. And so that's why I'm here, my other friend, I'm knocking on your door, please. You know, give me the friend so that I can go back and I can feed this other friend that came on a long journey. And then so Jesus, he says, basically, uh, so knocking on this friend's door, this friend who's woken up at midnight to get some bread, is he just going to wake up and, and, and then say, you know, go away, you know, go away, don't bother me, something like this, right? Um, no, Jesus says he will give the bread, and he will give the bread. But he tells him that the reason, the key behind why he gives the bread, he's saying that he won't give the bread just on the basis of being a friend. Right? That's not the reason. That's not the reason why he will go and give the bread, just because it is the basis of being a friend. He says he will give the bread because of his earnestness, his boldness. Right? His boldness, or in other words, I like the word earnestness before. Or some some uh, translations are like that. It's about the earnestness. It's about the boldness, which is a really earnest heart on the inside. Okay. So, uh, when you think about this, what does that mean for us? So, you know, how is God? You know, when you look at God, of course God is all loving. Of course God is all giving. He's the all loving, all giving in grace to all of us as well too. But. What this is talking about, this, this message, right, this parable, this is not talking about God. It's not talking about who God is. You know, God is the all-loving and all-giving God of grace. No, it's not talking about God, but it's talking about us. So it's saying, are we going to God when we pray simply on the basis of our relationship, right? So we go simply on the basis of our relationship. We say to God, God, I love you. I love you, God. I have a relationship with you. I love you, God. So, because I love you, God, you have to give me. You, know, you have to give me because I love you. And so, you know, there's this very, very lawful way that we pray to God. Oh, God, I'm good to you, Lord. I've done good. I've done good and righteous things before you, Lord. I have been good and in this way, and we're very lawful in this way. So, because I have been good, I deserve the good things from you. And so we build this lawful relationship with God. And this is how, in our relationship with God, and in our prayers before God, we get prideful and conditional. It means what we are doing is we're praying to God just to, in order to control my life. Oh God, I need this, or go, oh God, I need that. Oh, because God, I have been good, please give me this or give me that. And what we are doing in that is developing a lawful relationship with God, right? We are praying, in other words, with my pride in order to control my life. I'm praying in order to control my life. God, I've been good, so I should have good things, and it should be in this way. And so, you know, I come to pray, I come before God and pray in this very, very lawful way. You know, please give me, and what I want to do is I want to get what I want. Because I'm a good friend of you, God, come and give me, and give me what I want. And that is just to control my life. This is a very, very lawful way of praying. Jesus says, no, right? the attitude shouldn't be like this. The attitude of prayer has to be, have, have, have this bold earnestness inside of it. He's talking about a very, very deep heart, going to God with this kind of earnestness. You know, think about it, right? If there's a parent and then there's a child, right? So does the parent just give to the child? Well, will the parent want to give the child just because it's the child, right? Is that the kind of relationship a parent wants to develop for a child that, you know, that just giving to the child just because of the fact of the relationship, just because it's the child? No, it's not that. You know, it's this earnestness. The, the, they want the honest heart, an earnest, honest heart from, from the child, right? And then really giving out of, of that, not just simply based on this, this cold definition of a relationship, right? No, it, it, is, it is a warm, honest, earnest heart inside of them. And then, oh, the child asks, you know, oh, I'm hungry, you know, please give me some food. And then, you know, you know, giving, oh, just because of your maternity, I'm going to cook for you. No, 
you know, asking honestly and earnestly, and then the parent will want to give inside of that way. And so Jesus is speaking about this earnest heart. And so, you know, how can we then, you know, the question then comes then, how can we have this true heart of earnestness? Because, you know, we, it's very hard to have this, actually. You know, we can say this, and we can say that, but like, really, like, think about it, like, deeply, deeply having, like, this earnest heart, right? So if I say it's a, a true earnest heart, then it should be genuine, right? We can't just, like, have a fake earnest heart, like, just because, you know, pastor in the sermon said it, then, oh, suddenly I'm going to have an earnest heart, right? You know, it, it has to come from a, a genuine, deep place in the heart. So how is it that we can have an earnest heart? Well, the first thing we need to have is, of course, we need to have faith. Right? We need to have faith. It's that when it comes to earnestness, this true boldness and this earnestness, that's something that we receive from God. Right? That is God's love in us. When we have God's love in us, that helps us be earnest and bold in everything. So, you know, you come to find this, really, even when it comes to earnestness, the earnest aspect the, of love it is not self-generated, just because like I thought about it. Oh, the pastor said so, and so I thought about it, and then using my intelligence, somehow I'm smart, and I reason my way to earnestness, right? You know, this is, the, this is actually the problem that smart people have in faith. You know, if you're really smart, and I believe you're all very smart, and this is, can be the problem that we can have. You know, we're too smart, and so because we're smart, we always try to think about the way in which I can develop something into my heart. And so, you know, we, we, we try to think of our way into it. But, you know, really, faith is just really receiving from God, His grace. You know, earnestness comes from our heart because we're weak, right? We're weak. We're weak and we need, to, we need God's love, and so we need to overflow in that earnestness. Now, another aspect about this earnestness is that there is a limit. There is a limit to how earnest we can be about or about ourself, right? And when we pray for ourselves, right? So there is a limit to how earnest we can be to praying about ourselves. So what I'm trying to say is that when it comes to praying and praying, we have prayer topics and we have prayer meeting, we have prayer topics too, right? So uh, when we when we pray. It's good to pray for yourself. I'm not saying it's not good to pray for yourself. It is good to pray for yourself. But we need to know that only just praying for yourself, there is a limit. Right? There is a limit to praying for yourself. Because if we're just like praying for ourselves, like every day, we're just like all the time, only, only praying for ourselves, you know, you come to find actually, you know, our hearts become hard and dry. Oh, it's very like 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 very mysterious and weird like that that will happen like oh I'm like I'm praying for my heart to become better but then you know just being stuck in ourselves you know it actually becomes more hard and dry it's, the reason why is because something else can develop out of it we just become self centered right we just become self centered we're just praying for ourselves all the time always concerned only about the things of ourselves all the time and once again it's going back to the first thing I said all we're doing really is just seeking to control our life control all the aspects of our life. You know, the truth is, is that, you know, you know, we talk about prayer warriors in church, right? Oh, so, you know, you're a real prayer warrior, right? And we need, or church, Grassi Church, we need real prayer warriors inside of our church too. We need prayer people that really earnestly pray and pray and pray. But here's the thing I've, I've, I've never heard of a prayer warrior. <laughs> I've never heard about this. I've never, ever, ever, ever heard of a prayer warrior who just only prays for themselves. You know, I've never heard of that fact. You never call like a prayer warrior. Like, you're a prayer warrior because like, you're just like praying and praying and praying and praying for yourself. You know, but that doesn't happen, right? No one is called a prayer warrior because they're just, you know, all the time praying for themselves continuously. And so, you know, Jesus, he's actually giving us very, very simple and basic wisdom here. You know, what is the guaranteed way in order for us to have an earnest, true and earnest prayer? Well, it's with another person. So this man, so this person, right, this person is knocking on his neighbor's door, right? And so, you know, why is he boldly and earnestly like knocking on that door? He's not doing it for himself, right? 
Oh, well, because my other friend came on a long journey at midnight and he's hungry, so I'm praying for that person. So I'm, I'm asking on behalf of that person. And so, you know, you really come to find there is this deep, you know, there's the prayer for myself, but that's like very shallow level of prayer. It's good, but it's only like shallow level. Right? A much, much deeper, a much deeper level is praying for another. And when we pray for another, out of God's grace given to me, and then praying for another person, you know, oh, the prayer hits another level in that way. And so, you know, this is what Jesus is giving us, simple, basic instruction here. You know, this is how true prayer is. It's only in modern society where we become so self-centered, you know, always, always just self-concerned about myself, and all our prayer topics are only for ourselves all the time. But when you look, that's not how Jesus instructed us. You know, the early church wasn't like that either. When you look at the early church, they were all together praying in one heart and in one mind, and meaning they were praying for each other. They prayed for themselves, that's for sure. That's like the, the first level, the shallow level. But then you have to go deeper. You have to go deeper and you have to pray for others. And, you have to, and when you do that, you know, the love of God in you develops in a very, very deep place. You know, this is how love develops in us in a deep place. It is praying for others. So we have to pray for others. And also, what is a, something even, even deeper that we should pray for? Once again, we're going back to the title of today's message. It is, Thy Kingdom Come. Thy Kingdom Come here on earth as it is in heaven. You know, we need to pray for others. And what is praying for others? It is praying for all the lost souls out there to come to Jesus Christ. And so it is the Great Commission, it is the, it is the Kingdom of God. So, you know, when you look at prayer warriors, if our Gracia Church is to have prayer warriors in our church too, that is what we need. We need people that will pray for others and really, really earnestly, earnestly pray for God's Kingdom. This is when deep earnestness develops in us. If we really, really want a deep heart, you know, we, we always we talk about it, we have Bible studies, and we look at the Bible, and we pray, and we gather in service, and we're talking about, oh, we need to become deeper in our heart and in deeper in our relationship with God. You know, well, how can we do that? Well, we need to get out of ourselves. We need to pray for other people, and we need to pray for God's kingdom. Thy kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven. So today, let us have an earnest heart of prayer for others and for God's kingdom. God has already filled us up. He's already given us everything. He gave us His Son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross and He saved us from our sin. It's good to pray for myself, but, you know, let us go beyond and look towards others. An earnest heart, right, a deep heart, is one that is really in genuine communion and in a relationship with God. In that relationship with God, really, we have to have this earnest heart. When we have a relationship with God, then we should have an earnest heart at the same time. Jesus, he taught us today how to have an earnest heart. I pray we can be the ones that have this kind of relationship. Amen. Uh, Father God, we thank you, Lord. Uh, today, uh, we are looked at the message of your Lord's Prayer, Lord. The, uh, the, the prayer that you gave us that uh, taught us the basic way of prayer. That, you know, we should really pray for... Uh, that we can be a fruit, hallowed be your name, a glory of the love that you've already given us, to really, really pray for your kingdom to come uh, here on earth, Lord, that we really earnestly have that basic inside of us to pray for your kingdom and righteousness, for your daily bread, Lord, that you provide for us daily, not being greedy and looking for uh, like bread for like a year or five years or something like this, Lord, but you know, really praying for uh, what you give us now, what you can give us for today, Lord. And really also uh, praying for your forgiveness and our relationships with others to forgive others. And praying not to be in temptation, Lord. We looked at all these things that we don't want to fall into sin and, and these things, Lord, we should pray for this. And Lord, um, fundamentally as well, in the deep part of our heart, uh, we wish to have an earnest prayer. An earnest prayer going to you. And we come to find that we are weak in having this earnest prayer. We cannot have this on our own. But Lord, it is by having faith in you, receiving love from you, praying for others, and praying for your kingdom, we can develop a deep and earnest heart in this way. And we thank you, Lord, for your loving grace. And in Jesus Christ's name.